And before that, David Horovitch reads the final part of the history of the Peloponnesian War by the ancient Greek historian Thucydides. Athens has set out on a reckless mission to conquer Sicily under the command of the discredited and mercenary general Alcibiades. It's a mission that will change the face of Greece forever. We begin with an introduction from the abridger, Tom Holland. In 415 BC, taking advantage of the peace treaty that they had signed six years earlier with the Spartans, the Athenians embarked on their boldest venture yet, an expedition to conquer Sicily and its leading city, Syracuse. The whole great Athenian armament made the crossing to Sicily. Here they found a galley arrived from Athens for one of its generals, Alcibiades, with orders that he should sail back home to answer the charges made against him by the state with regard to the sacrilegious treatment of the herms, the sculptures in the city. For the same enemies of his who had attacked him even before he set sail had since renewed their attacks and the Athenians were now more inclined than ever to believe that the sacrilege had been done by him as part of a plot against the democracy. So Alcibiades left Sicily and sailed back as though on his way to Athens. But when he reached Thuria, he jumped ship and went into hiding, since he was afraid to go back and stand trial with all the prejudice against him that there was. Not long afterwards, Alcibiades, now in exile, crossed on a boat from Thuriae to the Peloponnese, and the Athenians passed a sentence of death on him in his absence. Meanwhile, the Athenian forces in Sicily were in active preparation for their attack on Syracuse, and the Syracusans on their side were getting ready to move against the Athenians. First, the sling-throwers, slingers and archers on both sides engaged each other in front of the main lines of battle, and then trumpeters sounded the charge to the heavy infantry. So they went into action, the Syracusans to fight for their country, while on the other side the Athenians fought to conquer a country that was not their own and to save their own from suffering by their defeat. For some time no ground was yielded on either side. Meanwhile there were some claps of thunder and flashes of lightning with heavy rain, all of which added to the fears of the Syracusans, who were fighting their first battle and had very little familiarity with war. First their left wing was forced back, and then the Athenians broke through the troops in front of them. The Syracusan army was now cut in two and took to flight. The Athenians did not pursue them far. They were prevented from doing so by the numbers of still undefeated Syracusan cavalry, who charged and drove back any of the enemy they saw pressing the pursuit in advance of the rest. Nevertheless, the Athenians followed up the enemy as far as it was safe to do in compact bodies, and then returned to their own lines and put up a trophy. Winter was now drawing in and so the Athenians made quarters near Syracuse and sent messengers to neighbouring cities to see if any help could be gained from them, with the intention of opening the campaign at the beginning of spring. Meanwhile, the Syracusans sent representatives to Sparta to try to persuade the Spartans to do their part by sending a force to Sicily. Alcibiades, who had fled his Athenian guards rather than return with them to Athens, was also in Sparta at this time. After escaping his escort, he had crossed immediately from Thuria in a merchant ship and proceeded to Sparta on the invitation of the Spartans themselves. What you must now realize, Alcibiades told them, is that unless you help her, Sicily will be lost. The Sicilians lack the experience which Athens has, but might even now survive if they all united together. If Syracuse falls, all Sicily falls with it, and Italy soon afterwards. Nor should you imagine that it is only Sicily which is at stake. Should Athens conquer the West, then the Peloponnese will be menaced as well. It is vital, then, that you quickly take the following measures. You must send out to Sicily a force of troops that are able to row the ships themselves and take the field as heavy infantry as soon as they land, and, 
what I consider even more useful than the troops, you must send out as commander a regular Spartan officer to organize the troops that are there already, and to force into the service those who are shirking their duty. This is the way to put fresh heart into your friends, and make the waverers less frightened of joining in. This was the speech of Alcibiades, and the Spartans were duly persuaded. They appointed Gylippus, the son of Cleandridus, to be commander for the Syracusans, and he crossed to Sicily with seven hundred sailors and marines, a thousand heavy infantry and light troops, and a hundred horsemen. He arrived in Syracuse just in the nick of time. The Athenians had already completed a double wall of nearly a mile down to the great harbour. Gylippus recognized that it was essential to prevent the Athenians from investing the city, and so he ordered the Syracusans and their allies to begin building a wall of their own. This was to go from the city and head at an angle across the line of the Athenian walls, so that they would have no further possibility of completing their siege line. The Athenians therefore advanced to meet the Syracusans. In the battle that followed, Gylippus's cavalry charged and routed the Athenian left wing, with the result that the rest of the army also was beaten by the Syracusans, and driven back headlong behind its fortifications. Next night the Syracusans achieved their object with their cross-wall, and carried it past the end of the Athenian fortifications. It was now no longer possible to stop them, and the Athenians, even if they were victorious in battle, had been deprived for the future of all chance of investing the city. Next, the Syracusans prepared to meet the enemy at sea. First, though, they cut down the length of the prows to make them more solid, for they thought that in this way they would have an advantage over the Athenian ships, which, instead of being constructed like theirs, were light in the prow. This was because the usual Athenian tactics were not to meet the enemy head-on, but to row round and ram him amidships. The fact that the battle would be in the great harbour, though, where there would be many ships in a small space, was in the Syracusans' favour, since charging prow to prow and striking with stout, solid rams against hollow and weak ones, they would stave in the enemy's foreships, while in that narrow space the Athenians would not be able to use their skill in manoeuvre, on which their confidence was based. And so it proved. It was a hard-fought fight, in which many men and many ships were lost on both sides. But at the end of the battle, it was the Syracusans who took up the wrecks and the dead bodies, sailed back to their city, and put up a trophy. The Athenians, though, were so oppressed by the weight of their misfortune that they never even thought of asking for permission to take up their dead. When Nicias sought to persuade them to man their ships again and try and force their way out of the harbour, the sailors refused point-blank to go on board. So demoralized were they by their defeat that they no longer regarded victory as a possibility. Instead, the Athenians were resolved to retreat by land. No Greek army had ever suffered such a reverse. They had come to enslave others, and now they were going away frightened of being enslaved themselves. And instead of the prayers and paeans with which they had sailed out, the words to be heard now were directly contrary and boded evil as they started on their way back, sailors travelling on land. As they retreated from Syracuse, so the Syracusans followed them, and day by day, action by action, picked the Athenians off. A considerable part of the army was killed outright, and the slaughter was very great greater than any other that took place in this war. Eventually Nicias surrendered himself to Gylippus, whom he trusted more than he did the Syracusans, telling him and the Spartans to do what they liked with him personally, but to stop the massacre of his soldiers. 
The Syracusans and their allies now brought their forces together into one, took up the spoils and as many of the prisoners as they could, and went back to their city. They put the Athenian and allied prisoners whom they had taken into the stone quarries, thinking that this was the safest way of keeping them. Nicias, a man who, of all the Greeks in my time, least deserved to come to so miserable an end, they put to death against the will of Gylippus. Meanwhile, those who were in the quarries were terribly treated. There were many of them, and they were crowded together in a narrow pit, where, since there was no roof over their heads, they suffered first from the heat of the sun and the closeness of the air, and then, in contrast, came on the cold autumnal nights, and the change in temperature brought disease among them. Lack of space made it necessary for them to do everything on the same spot, and besides there were the bodies all heaped together on top of one another of those who had died from their wounds, or from the change of temperature, or other such causes, so that the smell was insupportable. At the same time they suffered from hunger and from thirst. It is hard to give the exact figure, but the whole number of prisoners must have been at least seven thousand. When the news reached Athens, for a long time people would not believe it, even though they were given precise information from the very soldiers who had been present at the event and had escaped. Still they thought that this total destruction was something that could not possibly be true. And when they did recognize the facts, Great indeed was the fear that beset them, and the consternation. So many men of military age, so many ships, so many funds, all lost. And so it was, in the wake of the disaster, that the Athenians had little hope of being able to survive. The expedition to Syracuse was the greatest Greek action that took place during this war, and, in my opinion, the greatest action that we know of in Greek history. To the victors, the most brilliant of successes, to the vanquished, the most calamitous of defeats, for they were utterly and entirely defeated. Their sufferings were on an enormous scale. Their losses were, as they say, total. Army, navy, everything was destroyed. And out of many, only few returned. So ended the events in Sicily. The Athenian defeat at Syracuse did not end the war. For another nine years, against increasingly desperate odds, Athens continued the struggle. But by 404 BC, it was over. The defeat of Athens was total. Thucydides himself did not live to describe it. The events of his great history end in 411 BC. He knew, though, that the humiliation of his city was coming and it gives to his peerless account of war and statecraft the authentic character of tragedy. Tom Holland concluding the final part of his abridgment of the history of the Peloponnesian War, which was read by David Horovich. The producer was Justine Willett.